Well, good morning to uh, all your viewers and welcome uh, to this program on the Tea House uh, craze. Uh, I'm Bob Minish, president of the Friends of the Sibley Historic Site. We're sponsoring this program. Our organization for over 30 years has uh, provided support for the Sibley Historic Site. Uh, just this past year, uh, we installed roller shades at the visitor center, the Dupuy House. Uh, and we've also sponsored the Mendota After Hours programs. Uh, normally, uh, we would have an annual meeting and we'd have a presentation like this with our annual meeting. Uh, last year with the pandemic, we couldn't do that. And we you know, had our presentation done virtually. And so we thought we would do that again this year. And uh, traditionally with our annual meetings, we would hold a raffle as the fundraiser. We're doing that this year. And after the program, uh, we'll do the drawings. And the, the, if um, Lawrence will keep the video running, you can watch us do the drawing for you know, I think we've got nine uh, books that will be raffled off. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Ann Essling. Ann is a longtime board member of our organization, also an avid historian. And she wrote uh, a book that we published on the history of the Mendota area. She was the one that brought uh, Jan Whitaker's book on the tea house to our attention. And I asked uh, uh, Ann if she would contact Jan and see about getting a presentation. So Ann, uh, I'll turn it over to you to uh, introduce Jan. Thanks, Bob. Well, it was 20 years ago, I wrote an article about the Minnesota Sibley House. And um, so I learned about the history of, of the site when the Daughters of the American Revolution owned it. As early as 1910, when the Minnesota Daughters of the American Revolution acquired the Sibley House, they made plans to have a tea house to serve refreshments to the guests and to raise money for the site. When I was researching the history, the plans for a tea house puzzled me. These early Minnesota DAR were not businesswomen. Most of them were housewives. What motivated them to do this? Then I read Jen Whitaker's book, Tea at the Blue Lantern Inn, The Tea Room Craze in America. And I had this aha moment. Her book explains that in the early 1900s, tea rooms were an actual craze. Women were independence, but there were social limitations as to what was respectable. According to Whitaker's book, owning, operating, and working in a tea room was acceptable for respectable women of the day. The Minnesota DAR obtained the Dupuy House in 1927. The next summer, the Sibley Tea House opened, serving 2,850 guests with a profit of $377.47. From then on, most summers, the tea house was open daily, May through October, except Monday for luncheon and dinner, noon until 7.30 p.m. In 1935, new porches were added to have more room to seat guests. And the next year, they added a new water and sewer system. I don't know what they did before then, but I'm afraid to ask. At the height of the Depression in 1936, 14,225 meals were served to guests from nearly every state in the Union and several foreign countries. College women were hired as waitresses. One of our Friends members, Marvel Mo Anderson, a college student at Augsburg College in 1948, wrote that she waitressed six days a week and earned $60 a month at the tea house. And as you can imagine, tips were crucial to her summer savings. The tea house closed during World War II, but it reopened until the 1970s when it closed due to increasing health codes that would require a $10,000 capital investment. Ms. Whitaker grew up in St. Louis and became interested in tea rooms because her mother mentioned having enjoyed them. As the author was a teenager then, Tea rooms were a thing of the past, and she had no idea what her mother was talking about. Ms. Whitaker describes her writing as social history. Tea at the Blue Lantern Inn gave me almost a centuries-old snapshot of Minnesota women's social history. Besides Tea at the Blue Lantern Inn, she wrote The World of Department Stores and Service and Style and How American Department Stores Fashioned the Middle Class. She now lives in Massachusetts, where she collects tea room memorabilia, which I would love to see. Thanks to the magic of Zoom, she is joining us here in Minnesota. 
and wherever you are to tell us about early 20th century women and their passion to own and operate tea rooms. Jan, welcome. Thank you, Ann. Let's see. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me and I'm very pleased to be here. So I'm going to focus on Minnesota tea rooms, which it turns out that is a lot like other tea rooms in Massachusetts, as a matter of fact. So I found a few pictures here of the Sibley Tea House, um, women sitting on the porch in 1930, and they're the longtime managers of the tea house, uh, Harvey and Clara Piffner. And an ad here, home cooking, varied, varied menus, naturally cool and restful surroundings, 1942. So home cooking was frequently emphasized by tea rooms. You can call them tea rooms. Some people call tea house. Of course, that one was an individual building. Uh, are they called tea shops? Um, and here I found a menu from 1960, and we see that there was plenty of beef and lamb and other foods and plenty of desserts, which is another highlight of tea rooms in general from 1960, this menu. Um, but what were the early tea rooms? Well, you know, they were like uh, Sibley, they were run, a lot of them by organizations such as the DAR, women's colleges, historical societies, charitable groups, um, and they, those were all over the country. They served several purposes. Obviously, one was to raise money, though that was not always successful. And the second was to provide a pleasant meeting space for members. And uh, in 22, 1922, for example, the Minneapolis League of Women Voters announced that they were going to open a tea shop. And also in the early 20s, uh, there were two tea rooms that were started by Republican women's clubs. Um, one was called the Blue Elephant, and that opened in 1920. And then there was the Red Elephant. I don't exactly know what those col colors signified but they were very popular places, especially the Red Elephant. Um, so around the turn of the century, what was changing was that women were getting out of the home more. They were going out into public, which was not always a totally okay thing to do in the 19th century. They were out on the street, they went downtown, they were working more, uh, and they were more involved in charitable, cultural, and political organizations. So department stores, this is why I'm starting here with Dayton's, uh, even though it's later material, um, they were some of the first to capitalize on women in public. And I think the first one uh, in Minnesota that I know of was um, Donaldson's. And Dayton's was also very early um, to open. And here you see this, you know, not looking like a tea room room at all, but of course that's later. A lot of them eventually dropped the name tea room. Um, and the Tiffin Room, Tiffin being another name for tea, which is probably a more casual place, I'm guessing. Because um, a lot of the big stores, they had more than one space devoted to eating places. Um, hmm, did I skip one? Okay. Donaldson's, another. And you see this tea room uh, they had, they call it there the cafe, Donaldson's Tea Rooms. Um, because usually they said rooms, um, and that was because the usually they had a men's tea room. Of course, they did not call it a tea room. They called it a grill, and women were not allowed in it, typically. So here we have in Duluth uh, their glass block, and eventually they named their tea room the Gray Salon. And I gather it's very well remembered by people from Duluth. Um, Priscilla's Tea Shop was in a store that I think was maybe originally a furniture store, the New England store. Sometimes they said Pris Priscilla's in New England. This is a later um, ad, but it actually started in 
1908. So it was another early tea room in Minneapolis. In Minneapolis yeah. Um, but the here's one that's not really a tea room in the sense that it has food. You can see there just these rather small tables and there are a few chairs. And this is a postcard of Louise Morton's quality shop. Um, what you see here is like someone who had kind of uh, elite refined taste. I think some of these early tea rooms that were started by individual women as their own businesses. So this is where she, her shop where she sold imported oriental go goods. Apparently she did her buying in New York City. And um, if you brought in this card, so she sent this card, I'm guessing probably to the wealthy women of Minneapolis that she wanted to come into her shop and to induce them to come in, she offered them and a friend a free cup of tea. So I guess they sat at those tables and they had their free tea. Um, and she called her tea room the sign of the samovar, but you can see it is her shop. Well, Louise, um, despite her good taste, was her shop was a failure. And the next year after this card came out, she declared bankruptcy. And she ended up opening the Priscilla tea room that we just saw. Um, and it was at first it was in the um, area of the oriental rugs. So you see her oriental connection. Another here, the Handicraft Guild. So again, I would say this is probably a kind of elite, elite institution. I don't know exactly who belonged, but it was made for crafts people. But this arts and crafts uh, style, you know, was a rather, hmm, what should I say? Yeah, definitely a refined taste and very advanced for its time. And in this building, they acquired their own building, um, a three-story building. And they had all kinds of things, an auditorium, workshops, classrooms, studios, a sales room where they sold some of the things that were made, a bookshop, and uh, offices for interior designers. So I don't know how long that lasted or whether it was open to the public, I'm uncertain. But you can see this arts and crafts style there is simple and kind of um, very simple kind of style that was, you can recognize it immediately when you see it. Um, another early one that I was not able to really find anything out about was Miss Lindbergh's in Duluth. And so that's an, an early one, but who Miss Lindbergh was, I don't know. This one was not successful. Apparently it only lasted about a year and a half. Um, this in Duluth opened in 1914. It was originally built to be a confectionery and um, it operated until 1957. So that's a very long term for you know, any kind of eating place to last. The Brown Teapot, um, I think opened, I know nothing about it. So this ad is from 1915. Again, they mentioned home cooking, um, but how long, whether it was successful or whatever, I, I really don't know. Sunday dinner, 50 cents, smothered chicken. Um, this Edith Jones, who opened this tea room, um, tea shop, as it was called, actually a lot of them were called tea shops. She was really a very uh, successful, I would say, because um, she established this one in, 1920, but previously she had started the cafeteria system in Minneapolis high schools, and that was in 1910. So likely she was a home economist because they were very involved with school cafeterias and lunchrooms in starting them because at one time there were none. Um, so this is uh, ad is from the 30s, but in 1931. She also had two other tea shops. One is called The Garden, and it had trees and goldfish pond. It was in Rand Tower. Now, that means nothing to me, but I assume people in Minneapolis know what that means. Um, and she also had one called The Courtyard, and that was in the Baker Arcade. So she, you know, seemed to be unusually successful because, you know, as is true of restaurants in general, it was a very risky business. 
you didn't even have alcohol to make money from. So, um, you know, many of them lasted a very short time. This one I think is interesting uh, in Duluth. And this woman, uh, I love her name, Bergata Mo. Um, so she it looks like she had a rather stylish place also. I unfortunately couldn't find any pictures of the interior of it. So it's in this, I don't know how to say, Kula Shana Inn. Um, and then she also operated a tea room in this large, pretty large apartment building that had opened in the 20s, the Devonshire Apartments. So that you'll see later that she was not the only one there. There were at that time in some of these early apartment buildings would have restaurants or tea rooms in the building, possibly because uh, they may have had studio apartments with very tiny kitchen facilities. Now, this is the building that Bergetta Mall was in, and uh, it's still there. And I think it's on the National Register of Historic Places. It was designed by a noted architect. And it's a rather striking building right on Lake Superior. This one, you know, it's interesting. It's called a cafeteria, and I'm sure people must still know of it, even though it went out of business, um, you know, years ago. But it was, it's very well known by historians because they were two home economists. They were probably a couple, uh, two women, and they called their, their place was a cafeteria. It had a cafeteria line. But you can just tell by looking that it really looked a great deal like a tea room and it had, was decorated and, you know, candelabra on the tables. Um, and it was a quite successful, very well-liked place. And here's another picture of it. And there you can see the cafeteria tray line there. And um, it had the dishware is also very unusual, I think, for a restaurant, certainly for a cafeteria. You know, when you think cafeterias, a lot of the early cafeterias were very utilitarian looking. So this one is quite different. And this uh, is also the Silver Latch, um, a tea room, though it does not say that on the card. So sometimes you have to figure out, but you can kind of tell by looking, I would immediately suspected, oh, that must be a tea room. So this, I think, opened in the 20s. The 20s really was the tea room boom era uh, when so many of them started. And this card is later, but um, Inez Norton, the owner, um, interestingly enough, six years later, she partnered with Gerda Olson, who I discovered had worked at the Sibley Tea House and they opened a restaurant called Boulevard, Boulevard Twins, which apparently was a very fashionable restaurant in Minneapolis. But here's what's sort of partly behind all these tea rooms and where, where they were getting some of their customers. Um, so the Business and Professional Women Club or organization had its own tea room and you know, there were all these women that were working. And you can see most of these women look like they're probably middle-aged. It's hard to know what they did. They could have been buyers at department stores. They could have had any number of jobs. Maybe they were even secretaries, which at that time, you know, was considered a higher paid and better job, I think, than it later became. This was a very famous tea room at the Young Quinlan Women's Specialty Store, which was a very elite um, large store, not exactly a full department store, but similar. And Marcella Essler, shown there, I found a picture of her. She and her sister Elizabeth were asked to open this tea room. They had had another uh, business, maybe selling crafts before that. Um, so when this building, new building was built, um, Elizabeth Quinlan asked them to run the tea room. So you see in this ad, which they did until 1944. So this is advertising a um, fashion show. So tea rooms in department stores or big women's specialty stores like this would have fashion shows in the tea room and they would walk around from table to table so you could get 
a close look at the clothing here. It looks like there must have been male models as well for this formal clothing. It's really hard to believe that a lot of people needed evening clothes for the holiday season, but I guess they did then. Um, here's a drawing of the interior and you can see it was, again, this is a, an elite tea room for sure. Um, and the people, and there's a man there. So that, that's the interesting thing. Men were allowed to go into the tea room even though women were not allowed in men's grills, but they had to be accompanied by a woman. Um, here's another one up in the twenties. An interesting thing happened then. You can see that this one is called the Russian bear. Well, it was raided in 1927 along with three other tea rooms. And it, um, the reason was that they had these tea leaf, leaf readings with a fortune teller. And that was illegal in Minneapolis. So the case, however, was thrown out and they reversed that ordinance, if that's what it was. And uh, they decreed that fortune telling was just another form of entertainment, just like having an orchestra in a restaurant. So it was okay. Um, this one opened in 1927 in Brainerd, and it was opened by two sisters, the Archer sisters in this new building. It was an Elks building. And Helen Archer had managed a tea room in New York City on Fifth Avenue. So she had a lot of experience. Um, and it also had a soda fountain in the next room that we can't see here. And this one, um, I think, you know, there were a number of tea rooms that were in resort areas, and usually they were only open for the summer season. And this one uh, was open at least by 1927, I believe. I think it's the 30s here. I'm not too good at judging the date of these cars, but... Um, but I also found that uh, the historical society has these narratives that they recorded with people. And there was a native woman who said when she was growing up, her family bought groceries at this store. I think there were very few stores in this area. So it apparently also sold groceries, which is, you know, rather unusual. Um, this tea room is interesting because this one was owned by two men and the name Atlas, along with their other one that was called the Diana Tea Room um, that op opened in the 30s. This one opened in the 20s. Um, they were originally, um, the Greek, a lot of Greek born men were originally in the candy business and they, they made candy. But what happened was the package candy that came out kind of killed their businesses. Now, they still sold candy here, as, as it says on the part of this uh, postcard package. But they also added a soda fountain and they had ice cream. So it was a, I think it had two rooms in this tea room in Duluth. But, you know, it seems unusual that men went on a lot of men that on them were, in fact, um, Greek American. Uh, this one, here's another one that's in a... Uh, resort area, and it was run by a home economist, only open in summer, opened in the 20s, and she opened it with a former classmate from her school where she got her home economics degree. But she said something interesting. She observed that in the 1920s, all home economists dreamed of opening a tea shop, and I think a number of them did. Loretta's uh, was in this Park Avenue South apartments. So it's another one of these apartment building tea rooms. Uh, the, the building was built in 25, but Loretta didn't take this over until um, 1948 and named it after herself. And it closed in 98. I don't think she, she was not still the owner at that time. But interestingly, she had been a member of the Business and Professional Women's Club. So, you know, she was not just any person. She probably had been in business, you know, other kinds of business. Um, this is actually a little booklet that folded over like they gave us a, 
little premium, I guess, when you came to the pirate tea room that was in St. Paul. And there, here they encourage, you know, lodge meetings, clubs, and they had private dining rooms, banquets. And you will note that they also had palm and tea leaf readings for free. Um, it's the tea room things that started in 20, you know, they 27, they became, became legal. But in the depression, as you might imagine, um, they became very popular. And to some extent during World War II also, which is, you know, kind of sad if you really think about it. Um, so there were many places that had the tea leaf reading and you see this card, the cavern. This is what is called making the most of a basement space. So they made it to look like a cavern here. Um, this was another one that had been raided in 1927, along with the Russian bear, the jolly peasant, and the teacup inn. Now I just got a message. My connection is unstable. Turn that off. Then. Um, so let's hope for the best here. Here's another uh, ad for the cavern. And also an interesting thing that one of their tea leaf readers was to be on a jury and she was questioned whether she believed in the fortune she saw in teacups. And of course she had to be honest and she said, there's nothing to it, nothing at all, which does not really come as a big surprise, but I, I have to assume that some people that had their fortune told thought it was just a lark and others might have thought it was real. I don't know. Um, this is interesting because it was in a yearbook uh, in 1940. And here they're showing these high school boys eating in this, again, it says tea room cafeteria, which, you know, sounds odd. Um, so that was, you know, whether they frequently ate there or they probably got a free lunch when they took this picture, I don't know. But um, a lot of restaurants advertised in yearbooks and, you know, I don't know, maybe they didn't have a cafeteria where they went to school. It's hard to believe that, you know, but I guess they got off of school for lunch and they could go to a restaurant or tea room if they wanted. Um, the leaves, uh, that was around for a long time. Um, and obviously its name kind of advertises that it was another one with tea leaf readings. The ports, ports, um, it was recommended in a guidebook in 1949. I don't know the date of this match cover, but, um, and this uh, guidebook said that they had a farm near Forest Lake. I don't know where that is, but presumably some people might, where they grew all their vegetables. So this idea that restaurants should have fresh vegetables and that sort of thing, instead of getting them from, you know, across California, whatever, is not at all new. It used to be much more common, I think, back in those days. And here, this is a really strange story here. This one was called the Fond du Lac. I'm not sure how you say that either, um, tea room. But then um, it was also recommended in this 1949 guidebook. And you can see it was a smorgasbord type thing. It was owned by two women but it failed and it was taken over by a newcomer, this woman who, interestingly enough, um, and this is pretty odd, she renamed it this Cafe Stuga rather than Tea Room. And um, she put signs out saying no beer or liquor. Of course, you know, supposedly Tea Rooms didn't have beer or liquor, though it would have been legal at this time. And she um, also has said no smoking, Christian atmosphere. The kind of, you know, so that's odd. I have to say, I, I've never found a tea room <laughs> that took that line of thought. But um, the interesting thing I think that's kind of ironic is that historically, one thing tea rooms were criticized for was the women smoking in them. So back in the teens and 20s, that was quite a popular place to go and smoke because, you know, a lot of people frowned on women smoking and they didn't mind men smoking then, but women smoking was considered scandalous and hor horrific. And 
So they didn't want to see it. So the tea room was kind of, you know, almost a, like a women's club where you could do things that you wouldn't probably do elsewhere in public. So I close here with the names of others. So there were a lot of others that I encountered as I was doing my research. And here you get some of the names, you see some of the names, um, but I don't really know anything about them for the most part. But you, we, you will note there's kind of a theme, the green dragon, the crimson candle, the blueprint, which is kind of interesting. Um, and you know, you kind of have a lot of colors, blue willow, um, and you have these, these were all in Minnesota, yep, um, Green Gables, Golden Rule. So there were, the, having a color in the name was very popular across the country and animals too. So here you see, or whatever you wanna call it, cricket, um, black bat. Um, there were many that had some kind of name like that. So I, anyway, that's just, I think it's kind of interesting why they did that, I believe, it's probably the connection with colonial inns and taverns, which often had names like that. And so I think that when they started, especially I know in Massachusetts, a lot of women wanted to recreate a colonial kind of interior and with the name and sometimes with the signs also that look like those old wooden signs that were carved. Um, and I'm guessing that that kind of carried across the country that idea of having the, the those kind of names, even if yours was not that. colonial. And here we are at the end. So I want to say thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to take any questions. Okay, so I do stop short. Okay, there I am. Chat to see if there's any questions. No, she's going to read. Are there any questions? Thank you, Jen, for the presentation. Yes, if you have any question, you can write them in the in the chat section that's at the bottom um, of your screen, or you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. But otherwise, if there's any question, I'll read them to Jen um, in the chat. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Anne is asking, were the tea houses ever raided for political reasons? And were women talking politics at the tea houses? Well, I, I know the red elephant and the blue elephant, they definitely were. I mean, there are many, many articles about, they would put on pageants where it looked like they made fun of maybe the opponents. I'm not really sure exactly what their pageants were. Um, so those were very political. And as far as being raided, uh, I assume you mean for you know, violating prohibition, which I mean, is a very important thing about tea rooms that they were so popular in the 20s because they didn't, it was a time when you could compete without alcohol, which, you know, is a very important factor, I think, in, in the success that they did have in the 20s. So there were tea rooms that violated prohibition, uh, yes. And there were tea rooms that were what you would call fake tea rooms. Um, usually they would be in sort of remote spots and I, you know, I have found not in, I didn't find this in Minnesota, but there could have been such things where they even had prostitution in some of these tea rooms. Um, it was a good blind, I guess, for some illegal activity. If you called it, you called it a tea room. It wasn't really a tea room, needless to say. But I have encountered that, though I didn't run across any in Minnesota. Political raids. Political raids. I don't know what that would be really. I mean, I'm curious if anybody knew of any of these places that I mentioned. I mean, most of them probably were gone long ago, but um, I wondered if anybody went, oh, I, I know that, or I know where that was, or that sort of thing. Well, people are uh, maybe thinking of the place they recognize. Uh, I got a, in the direct message, a question. Um, mm -hmm. 
from Susan. What, um, let me see here. What hours did tea rooms open? Mail times or afternoon? Were any mm -hmm. open during the day, but not in the evening and vice versa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had a variety of uh, times, I think. They're probably their biggest meal was lunch. Um, but uh, a lot of them were open for dinner also. They were not typically open for breakfast. You know, they were not full service restaurants in that respect. Um, but, you know, things that were, some were not open for dinner, I think, but a lot of them were. Um, and, you know, they, also really did a lot of, you know, you might call it almost catered, but, you know, banquet type things, or people would have engagement parties, or and they would celebrate anniversaries and have a big group and that sort of thing. So they, I think they really like groups. They had bridge clubs that would meet in them. So in the afternoon, yeah, that would be something that they would really be eager to have, like a bridge club come and play bridge and have afternoon tea. The afternoon tea part I think was not, you know, you didn't make much money off of that, to be perfectly honest, I think. Um, and if they originally had it in mind only to do that, they quickly learned that you had to have more going on than just afternoon tea. There, there was no way that you could make it just having afternoon tea. And um, I have another question. Were staff mostly volunteers or were they paid? Well, for the, these tea, tea rooms that were run by the organizations, I think they were. They often depended on volunteers, their members to like run them. I don't know how long that lasted because, you know, that's pretty tough to do that. I think that you might start out that way and then decide you had to have people that were hired. Um, but no, most of them, you know, had regular waitresses. Now, sometimes it may have been college students. Um, they did not have waiters, I don't think. You know, that would be unusual. They, they, mostly they were all women operations, if they were, you know, unless they were owned by men like the Atlas was, because men, sadly enough, uh, would not work under women. So you, they would not take orders, directions, or whatever from women. So you pretty well, if you were a woman owning it and managing it, you had to have an all women staff. And then Robin is asking, what were some of the most unusual or dated foods um, that you mm. observed on, on menus? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know if they're dated. I mean, you know, there was a time when all restaurants kind of used to serve tomato juice. And I think I saw that on the Sibley House menu. Uh, and that was kind of a mid-century thing that you would start out with tomato juice. I personally, I don't know why I find that funny, but um, so that seems very dated to me now. But uh, the thing that was really popular in them, I would say one of their most popular dishes was chicken. And, you know, chicken was not as readily available and as inexpensive as it later became. And I think that um, it was really a popular thing to do if, you, if you're talking about these rural or resort areas to drive out to the country, especially in Massachusetts where distances are shorter and go on Sunday, like the whole family would go to a tea room and they would have a chicken dinner that was extremely popular. So I would say that was one of their most popular. And, and the um, Richard's Treat, I don't know if you remember, there was a green bowl that was sitting there with those dishes that I had a picture of. That was for their chicken pot pie, I think. So I think that that, that kind of thing, that's what would count as home cooking. But as we saw in the Sibley menu and others, they also would have steak and that sort of thing. And maybe particularly at dinner, because at dinner, would be more a time more likely for the husbands to come maybe with their wife and they were gonna be maybe more expecting beef on the menu. And that's my interpretation. <laughs> but desserts, as I say, they were really popular. Now some things like um, some of those puddings and stuff I think would, you know, jello. I mean, no, those are quaint now, right? But, 
But tea rooms weren't the only ones that had that on menus. So, but they did, yeah, they did push lighter food. I think they had more salads than you would generally encounter in restaurants, especially maybe in the teens and twenties. Um, and those were, you know, actually sort of expensive, you know, to have some of the ingredients for salads at one time, lettuce salads and that sort of thing. And then NG is asking, were there flavored teas or basically just black tea served? You know, Americans truthfully were not really so into tea that they were, I think, that picky about having certain kinds. So I, I don't really, in general, have not seen the kinds of teas listed much. So it just thinks, I think it was just tea. <laughs> you know, in the same way that on menus, coffee was just coffee. They didn't say it was from Kenya or anything like that, um, or from Hawaii. I mean, that all came later. And I think that's kind of true of tea. Uh, people who are very fond of tea, you know, will be very particular about where they buy it and where it comes from maybe today, but I don't think that was so true then. And then you mentioned a few um, dessert, but what desserts, uh, because Sarah is asking, what desserts were um, the most popular mm -hmm. in the 20s and in the 30s other than the weird mm -hmm. jellos <laughs> that you would often yeah. see? <laughs> well, cakes and pies, but I think especially cakes because cakes maybe took a little more artistry to make a really good cake than pie was kind of, you know, pie could be found in sort of cheap cafes from time immemorial, I would almost say. You know, in, in Massachusetts, pie and donuts, those are things you ate all day. You know, pie was just food. It wasn't dessert. So I think cake had more of a um, kind of halo around it. And I think that they specialized in cakes because that was also maybe more associated with women and home cooks and putting a lot of effort into what you did that showed up kind of, or could show up. And then Millie is asking, is there a plan to continue the history of tea rooms from the seventies and beyond? You know, there has been, there was a revival. I kind of would date it to the 80s maybe. Um, and occasionally I now I will be contacted by someone who runs a tea room. Um, uh, and I think that they have really emphasized afternoon tea. A lot of the ones that have, have started up and they will have the, you know, you've seen these things with the tiers where they have the little sandwiches and then they have the little cakes and those sort of things the fancy afternoon tea, um, which I, I never saw that back in the olden days that, that we're talking about here, that they had those. So I think that it's been glorified a great bit, the afternoon tea. And sometimes women, or I have found this where there used to be a, a magazine devoted to tea rooms, believe it or not. I don't think it exists anymore. Not sure how they're doing now. I, I'm sure a lot of them go out of business like crazy. But um, just as they always did. Again, as I say, they charge a lot for those afternoon teas with all the fancy sandwiches and everything. But even so, I think it, it'd be pretty hard to make it with that. So, um, you know, and they, they recreate the Victorian days, a lot of them, which again, they hated the Victorian days back in, in the 20s. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of like imagining that you're recreating history, but you know, really, you're not recreating the tea room history, which I think is kind of funny, but you know, people are welcome to do that. You can do anything you want basically, right? <laughs> um, so they will, and women will wear hats and they'll have pink themes. I never saw pink in any, I mean, to, to the extent I've seen colors, no pink. So it's just, it's just this ultra feminine kind of theme, which I think the early tea rooms, they were more into women's liberation of its day, you know, getting the vote and being politically active and getting a good job and that sort of things. Even if they were, you know, women that were housewives, they still had this sort of a little more progressive outlook, I think, than, you know, wanting to be super feminine and wear pink and hats and all that sort of thing. They did wear hats, but everybody wore hats and it wasn't like they were, you know, uh, going against the tide, which I would say wearing a big frilly hat is doing today. Uh, 
That's great. Um, those are all the questions I have for now. If you have any uh, other, we can ask um, before we end here. I know Bob was mentioning there's a drawing to uh, for some books. Um, right. If you keep uh, keep on uh, with the video, uh, Jan. Thank you so much for that presentation. I learned a lot. And uh, oh, thank uh, you, Bob. I re I, re I appreciate being invited. Going to Richard Street, so that drawing name. Uh, ring a bell with me. Oh, you um, did go to Richard's Treat, yeah. Um, you did go to Richard's Treat cafeteria. Well, uh, the, yeah, the, the cafeteria. Yeah. I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to try now to to draw, and I'm going to turn my phone around because I'm using this on the phone. So my my wife will show up. Uh, I'll ask her. Can you see yourself in the picture? I think so. Okay, she's doing the the drawing for. And we're doing the first book we're going to draw is uh, your your uh, the, the uh, tea house is uh, the, the mirror books Jan the uh, tea at the Blue Lantern Inn. So okay. and we'll do that. Uh, we gave two of us our books. And we'll I just want you to know those are rare books now because uh, they are out of print. So <laughs> right. But, yeah. We, we used to spread all these out on the bed and let the dog jump on them to mix them up. But our, our little dog now can't get that far. So we just had to <laughs> do them on the bed and jump them up. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's, let's see what we have here. Ruth Urkela. Okay, Ru Ruth is uh, one of the uh, real stalwarts at keeping up the Sibley Gardens. So, uh, so she'll enjoy that. Okay, our next, our next one is Minnesota's own Betty Crocker. Yes. Mr. and Mrs. David Faribault. Okay. Uh, they live down in Iowa, but uh, the Faribault's uh, house is uh, one of the mainstays at the Sibley site. Okay. Henry and Hastings Sibley. Henry. This is a classic. Uh, right. right. Rhoda Kilman, a longtime historian of the Minnesota Historical Society, wrote this real outstanding biography. Of, uh, Alice Miller. Okay, another longtime member of our friends. Uh, okay. Bush Runner. A very interesting book. Uh, this uh, journals, it was based on journals of here, the three Radisson that he wrote when he was a guest of Charles uh, the first at uh, uh, King of England, who was the, the one who was beheaded. Uh, but obviously before that, Charles the first was quite interested in what were the, the stories of the new world. Uh, Shirley Sternquist. Another, another long-time member. Uh, now we have a book that Ann uh, Esslin read and recommended, uh, Minnesota's Geologist uh, of uh, uh, Winchell. Oh, whoops. Alice Miller again. Yeah, Only one, one per person here. Let's see. Dan Seidler. Okay. Dan is... Uh, Vice President of our organization. I think this may be the, one of the first times he's ever won at a raffle. Okay. Okay. The Dakota yeah. War Tribes. Oh, uh, John Heyman uh, spoke at our uh, friend's annual meeting. I think it was in 2018. Uh, Susan Olson. Okay. Uh, you're not, uh, not familiar with her. Okay. Lakota America. This is a, a excellent new book uh, by uh, a, a fellow from Finland who got his PhD in the U.S. and is teaching now at Oxford. Okay, Roberta Seafelt. Okay, Roberta used to be, be on our board and was secretary for a number of years. Okay, and the last one here is. No, we have a oh, the, the Blue Lantern. Oh, I, the Blue Lantern is the very last. Yeah. It was covered by this. Uh, this is the. Uh, State of uh, Wonders, Minnesota, which we all agree with. Yeah, it was a, by a couple of Star Tribune writers. Mary Lou Reed in California. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, she'll be pleased with that. That would bring some good memories to her. And our one other Jan Whitaker book. Barb Thurston. Okay. Barbara's, What's the name uh, of that book? Uh, uh, the, oh, the, uh, 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 yeah, Tia at the Blue Lantern uh, Inn. 
Oh, T the blue lantern. Yep. Okay. Right. Right. So, so there we have the nine bucks. I will be come back on the screen, but uh, and we'll be sending those out to the winners uh, very soon. Uh, oh. Perfect. And we had a last. Um, I got a direct message. If Jen, before we go, if you can talk a little bit more about the role of tea rooms in women's liberation. Oh, that, you know, it's hard to do any direct tracing there. I think that um, just being in public, like I was saying, I think uh, having a space of your own. Uh, otherwise, you know, a lot of restaurants, if women went there, they should be accompanied by a man. And there were some places in the early 20th century, they would not allow women to eat there, especially in the evening, unless they were accompanied by a man. Um, shall I explain why? I mean, it's because they assumed that they were prostitutes. So you can see the giant leap from there to like, you know, especially having your own place where you felt 100% comfortable. I think that's huge. Um, but I'll also say that when, when women were trying to win the vote, many towns, and I have this on my blog, I wrote about this, um, Many towns, cities, you know, mostly this is in cities. Most tea rooms other than resort, they're in cities, right? Big cities, bigger cities. Um, that there were these get out the vote or get the vote rather, you know, uh, tea rooms that were devoted to that, to propagandizing for women getting the vote. So, I mean, that is, is very directly political. And um, that was, you know, and then there were also women would have teas in their home where they would raise money for the group or just try to get people behind it, basically. Um, sometimes those tea rooms to, to get women to vote would be in like Wall Street and they were, were for men. So they, you know, women weren't voting, so they couldn't vote for that. So they had to get men to vote for it. So they tried to win them over with uh, food and desserts. <laughs> And I don't know, I guess they had some success because anyway, women did get the vote. <laughs> yes, that's, um, that's great. Thank you, uh, Jen. I think that was all for, for the question. Um, like we said at the beginning, we're, we recorded this presentation. So we'll send a link to everyone, anyone who registered. So if they couldn't join us today, they could watch it at a later time or if you wanna watch it again and take more notes on some of the information that Jen provided. Um, thank you yeah, so much. And if anyone wants to contact me, you know, and thinks of some question or whatever, I'd be happy to share whatever I can with you. That's great. And I thank can you. add uh, Jen's email in the, in the link for- Yeah, please do. As, as more question, I'll, I'll be sure to, to do that. And I don't know if, um, Bob had a few last words, but otherwise just, uh, we're right at the noon uh, one hour mark and yes. Just uh, a real deep thanks, Jen, for the this very timely talk. Uh, our Sibley Historic Site wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for the work of the GAR women in preserving that. So I think it's appropriate to, yeah. to have a topic like this. Uh, yeah. it's, so thank you so much and uh, we oh, greatly appreciate you. it. And thanks Lawrence for uh, all your work and putting this on. Yeah, happy to do it. All Great. right. Goodbye, everyone. Have a bye good bye. Day, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you.